So thank you for joining today's session on Scottish personal injury claims. My name is Laura McMillan and your other speaker today is Gemma Nicholson. We are both solicitors in Brodie's liability claims defence team. Now this session is designed to broadly cover two areas. Firstly, we will bring you up to speed with developments in Scottish civil justice reform, including things like qualified one-week cost shifting and group proceedings. Then we'll take through some important court decisions from Scotland over the past 12 months. We're also going to mention a few English decisions which we think might impact on Scottish claims in the future. So turning firstly to Scottish civil justice reform, well, where are we with that? Uh, as you probably know, the primary piece of reform legislation was the Court Reform Scotland Act 2014. It set out to not only reform personal injury litigation, but other litigation as well, and the courts more generally. However, today we are focusing on recent changes affecting personal injury and the changes yet to come. The Civil Litigation Expenses and Group Proceedings Scotland Act 2018 came into force in June 2018. It's not as yet fully implemented, although the Scottish Civil Justice Council lists the implementation of the 2018 Act as a high priority. One recent introduction under the Act, however, was the regulations allowing success fee arrangements. That is in the form of a speculative fee or a damages-based agreement. These came into force on the 27th of April this year. If you want to look them up, they are catchily entitled the Civil Litigation Expenses and Group Proceedings Scotland Act 2018 Success Fee Arrangements Agreements rather, Regulations 2020. The regulations allow solicitors to agree a success fee with their client, but no other fee, regardless of whether or not damages are paid. Effectively, this authorises for the first time in Scotland a claimant solicitor to take a slice of their client's damages. Now, we know this was happening already with some claimant firms, but there was always a question mark over the enforceability of such success fee arrangements. Under the regulations, the success fee is capped at 20% of the first £100,000 of any claim, 10% of the amount over £100,000 but not exceeding £500,000 and 2.5% for any part of the damages over £500,000. So in effect this means a claimant solicitor could seek payment of a success fee on a £1 million claim of £72,500. And this, of course, would be in addition to any costs recovered from the defender as part of the normal claims or litigation process. We know that previously contractual success fee arrangements between claimant firms and their clients sometimes exceeded the caps now provided for in the regulations. So the opportunity to apply an enforceable success fee married with a reduced cap for those who were already doing so at higher rates, may well give claimant solicitors, and in fact claimants, an added incentive to maximise the amount of any damages awarded. So the impact of this recent reform has probably gone unnoticed generally in the legal and insurance media simply because of the circumstances we find ourselves in, but it's a fairly fundamental change to factor into how we handle claims going forward. And looking forward to now, to qualified one-way cost shifting. It seems that we've been talking about quarks forever. We know it's coming, but the necessary regulations to introduce it haven't been passed yet. It's something that the Scottish Civil Justice Council and its respective personal injury and cost and funding committees are working on, and it's thought that it will be introduced by the end of the year. The legislation setting down the parameters of quarks is Section 8 of the 2018 Act, and it confirms that a court cannot make an award of expenses against a claimant unless the claimant or the claimant's lawyer makes a fraudulent representation or otherwise acts fraudulently in connection with the claim or proceedings, behaves in a manner which is manifestly unreasonable in connection with the claim or proceedings, or otherwise conducts the proceedings in a manner that the court considers amounts to an abuse of process. Now, many of you will spot that fraudulent representation is a test here under A rather than fundamental dishonesty. Many people have considered that to be a higher bar than the fundamental dishonesty equivalent in England and Wales. For example, it's not thought it will encompass gross exaggeration of a claim. But I think we can expect litigation seeking to define the term and or attempts to rely on categories B or C instead where the fraud bar simply can't be reached. 
Interestingly, there is now the possibility of COCs not being applied if a claimant unreasonably delays in accepting a tender. And the question of whether COCs will apply to defenders who are not insured remains under review. And then on to the other major reform as far as personal injury is concerned, which is group proceedings. Section 20 of the 2018 Act allowed for a new form of procedure, namely group procedure, in the court of session. It's hoped this will avoid some of the procedural difficulties and delays that we've seen with group litigation in recent years, including the pelvic mesh, metal metal hip and contaminated waste cases. However, the new procedure can only be introduced once rules are in place, and unfortunately, those haven't been drafted yet. Progress has been made, though, with a working group set up in March this year. An informal consultation process has also been undertaken with key stakeholders, and it's anticipated that the rules will be available at some point this summer. That will enable, for the first time, a formal group procedure allowing multiple claimants to be part of one action and be bound by the outcome of that one action. I think it's likely to mean that we'll see an increase in group litigation in Scotland. So what else are we waiting on? Uh, pre-action protocols. Although we do of course have a compulsory pre-action personal injury protocol that has been in place for almost four years now, we're still waiting on compulsory disease and clinical negligence pre-action protocols. Those have been in the pipeline for some time now, but they still remain in the Scottish Civil Justice Council's work plan. So it's hoped we'll see those two at some point later this year. We're also awaiting simple procedure special claims rules to replace summary cause procedure, which still applies to certain types of action, including personal injury claims with a value up to £5,000. The Access to Justice Committee is carrying out a review into the existing simple procedure rules introduced in 2016, and it's likely that the draft special claims rules will be revised in light of that review. So no indication, unfortunately, beyond that of when they will be introduced. The last thing I wanted to mention, although it doesn't form part of the civil justice reform per se, is the rewrite of the chapter 42 rules in the court of session. These rules apply to clinical negligence and certain complex personal injury claims. The rules came into force on the 1st of March this year. Amidst some concerns from parties, particularly by defenders and their representatives, as to how achievable the front loading of these cases would be, in essence, um, under Chapter 42A, the rules require much earlier disclosure of evidence on both sides and it will involve greater case management from the bench. It is, however, important to note that the Sheriff Court equivalent at Chapter 36A remains unchanged. But overall, quite a lot of fairly recent and forthcoming procedural reform affecting personal injury claims that either alone or combined are likely to change the behaviour of personal injury litigators in Scotland. Uh, now, whether that will be more um, unforeseen reform to the handling of personal injury actions in Scotland following COVID-19 remains to be seen. So I'm now going to hand over to Gemma to kickstart our key cases section. Thanks, Laura. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for dialing in today. So Laura has summarised what the future legal developments will be and I'm now going to turn back to look at the past and to summarise some key court decisions delivered within the last 12 months. Those cover loss of society awards, the classification of primary victims and vicarious liability in a social context. The first case of note is McCulloch and others versus Fourth Valley Health Board. This case was decided by Lord Tyre sitting within the court of session and was published less than two weeks ago. It's important in respect that it is the most recent example of the court quantifying loss of society awards. Such awards and the way they are calculated is of course unique to Scots law. Certain relatives of the deceased can claim and the awards are intended to compensate family members for the distress, anxiety, grief and sorrow caused by the wrongful death of a loved one. In this case, Mr McCulloch tragically died aged only 39 after suffering a cardiac arrest at home. He'd been discharged from hospital the day before and the pursuers alleged that his death was caused by the negligence of a cardiologist employed by the health board. Eight loss of society claims were made in total. The health board denied liability and ultimately the pursuers action failed on the merits. But the court did still value two of the loss of society claims made where quantum had not been agreed in advance of the proof. 
The two claims were for the deceased children from his daughter, who was aged seven at the date of her father's death and was now 15, and his son, who was only 18 months old when his father died and was now nine. As is common for these types of cases, each claim was supported at proof by written statements produced on behalf of each child. The deceased daughter described a very close relationship. She was a daddy's girl and her father took her to events and to swimming and karate lessons. She was significantly affected by his death, dropping out of her leisure pursuits, experiencing anxiety and developing an eating disorder. The deceased son had no memory at all of his father and was upset by the fact that he had never experienced a father and son relationship. Since his father's death, he had struggled at school and found interacting with others difficult. Against these facts, the first pursuer, who was the children's mother and legal representative, asked the court to award £80,000 to each child. The court was referred to the jury decision in Anderson versus Brigbury Garage, where £80,000 was awarded to a child who was only six weeks old at the date of her father's death. In contrast, the defenders submitted that an award of £60,000 to each pursuer was appropriate in principle. Reference was made to Ryder versus Highland Council, where Lord Tarr himself valued the claim made by a 17-year-old child at £40,000, and to Stanger versus Flaws, where a jury awarded £50,000 to two sons aged in their 40s. When reaching his decision, Lord Tarr confirmed it was settled law that when assessing the appropriate level of award for loss of society, he must pay regard to jury and judicial awards in comparable cases. Jury awards, as many of you will know, are traditionally higher than the awards of judges sitting alone. Of the cases referred to by the parties, Lord Tyre considered that the Anderson case was most closely aligned to the case before him, given the young ages of the deceased children. He stated that the award made to young children had to reflect the loss of a parent throughout all or most of the, the claimant's childhood. In those circumstances, an award of £80,000 was appropriate. So the awards stated in this case are yet another example of the continuing upward trend in awards for loss of society. By way of recap, the average pre-2011 award to children was just £15,000. By 2015, the generally accepted range was thought to be thirty to £60,000. This latest award is 80. So the increase over time is stark and fairly significant. And this case also makes clear the age will factor very strongly in the valuation assessment, with younger children likely to receive more. So moving on now to the next case, um, it relates to the classification of primary victims. Now to date, that topic in Scotland has been the subject of only a handful of reported decisions. The relevant decision Weddell versus Glasgow City Council come from the personal injury court and the facts of the case arise from the Glasgow bin lorry crash. The pursuer, a student, sought damages for mental harm caused by the incident. In terms of the facts, the pursuer had witnessed the final stages of the crash. She was waiting to cross the road and texting a friend. She heard a loud bang and looked up. The bin lorry had collided with a taxi and was pushing it forwards. She gave evidence at proof that the vehicle seemed to be coming towards her out of control and that she thought she was going to be struck. She crossed the road and became aware that she was walking through the aftermath of a serious accident. She realised there had been fatalities and became increasingly upset, later breaking down. She was diagnosed as suffering from PTSD. It was accepted by the defenders that the driver of the bin lorry had been negligent and that they were vicariously responsible for his wrongdoing. It was also accepted that the pursuer was suffering from a recognised psychiatric injury attributable to the effects of the incident. The key point to be determined by the court was whether the pursuer was entitled to recover damages for that injury, given that she had come to no physical harm. As some or all of you may know, for reasons of policy, the law limits who can recover damages for suffering only mental harm. Only two classes of person can, so-called primary and secondary victims. Primary victims are those persons directly involved in an accident as a participant. Secondary victims are witnesses or bystanders who suffer mental harm through what they have observed. Secondary victims are not entitled to recover damages unless they satisfy additional criteria. The law proceeds on the basis that these are the two and only categories of person 
to whom injury for mental harm is reasonably foreseeable. So the pursuer argued here that she was a primary victim and the court held that to be classified as so, the pursuer must establish either that during events she was actually placed in a position of danger or reasonably believed herself to be so. The court made clear that the prospect or fear of physical injury must arise. Fear or horror of the aftermath was irrelevant. The court focused on what had happened as the pursuer waited to cross the road, being the only point when the bin lorry was in close proximity to her. The court held that no risk of actual physical injury had arisen as a matter of fact. The speed, distance and direction of the bin lorry and taxi were all considered with reference to locus plans, photographs and CCTV footage. From those, it became clear that at no stage was either vehicle coming towards the pursuer and that neither vehicle came within 12 metres of her. In its own words, the court held that on no view was this a near miss. Equally, the court did not feel that the pursuer did at the relevant time hold any genuine fear for her safety. Her reaction had been captured by CCTV. Upon hearing the bang, she showed no physical response, turned back to her phone and crossed over the road. In the court's view, the pursuer's fear arose from the horror of realising the pedestrian fatalities. Further, even if the pursuer did genuinely believe that she was in danger, this belief was not, in the court's view, a reasonable one to hold, because neither the bin lorry nor taxi, by reason of their direction and speed, were ever going to come into contact with her. Ultimately, therefore, the pursuer did not qualify as a primary victim and her claim failed. The bin lorry driver had been negligent, but with injury to the pursuer not reasonably foreseeable, he did not owe her any duty of care. So the decision here was perhaps one to be expected. It does not deviate from what has gone before, but it provides a very welcome addition to precedent and a very clear narration of the classification test, which will apply to primary victims in Scots law. For those who defend personal injury claims, it also provides comfort that cases involving only mental harm will continue to be tightly controlled for fear of the floodgates opening and indeterminate liability arising. So the third and final case, which I'll touch upon today, comes from England, it's from the English High Court, and it's Shelbourne versus Cancer Research UK. This case looks at vicarious liability in the context of social events. It predates the Supreme Court decisions, which Laura will speak about later, but is aligned in outcome. Its facts arise from a Christmas party, and no doubt that phrase brings some fond memories to some of us. Unfortunately, however, at the party in question, which had been organised by the claimant's employers, CRUK, the claimant suffered a serious spinal injury. She'd been on the dance floor when she was lifted off the ground and dropped by an intoxicated Mr B. The claimant sued CRUK for negligence, as well as claiming that they were vicariously liable for B's actions. Both claims failed at first instance and the claimant appealed. B was obviously in breach of his duty to the claimant, but one of the two questions to be determined by the court was whether CRUK were vicariously liable for his wrongful act. As most of you will know, the principle of vicarious liability renders a party accountable for the actions of another who is under their control. It's most commonly seen in the employer-employee context. In this case, however, B was not employed by CRUK. He was a visiting scientist who carried out research work in the laboratories of CRUK's Cambridge Research Facility. He was entitled to attend the party because of that role. There was no dispute here that B was a sufficiently integral part of CRUK's business, that CRUK was potentially vicariously liable for his acts. The relevant questions to the determination of liability on a vicarious basis for those set down by the Supreme Court in Muhammad, namely, what field of activities had been entrusted by CRUK to be and was there a sufficient connection between the position in which B was employed and his wrongful conduct towards the claimant to make it right for CRUK to be held legally responsible for reasons of social justice. The claimant argued that B's relevant field of activities included interacting with fail partygoers in alcohol-infused revelry, leading to the setting aside of the ordinary boundaries of social interaction all of which was authorised by the defendant for its own benefit, since it stood to gain from the enhancement of its employees' morale. 
the High Court considered this argument was only sustainable if CRUK did have a self-interest in organising the party, but did not consider that was the reality of the situation. The reality was that the CRUK party was voluntary, not compulsory. It was staff-led, not CRUK controlled, and it was motivated by the need to respond to employee expectation that this is what an employer does at Christmas time. It was not an event held for any business gain. Further, whilst the High Court accepted that these of field of activities was to be addressed broadly, the High Court was keen to recognise that the concept still did have to have boundaries. B's Bee's field of activities was his research work. It was not true here that B was doing his laboratory work when he lifted the claimant. His laboratory work had ended hours before and he was not required to attend the party. At the point of his wrongful conduct, the High Court held that the judge at first instance was correct. B was on a frolic of his own. This is a term which many of us lawyers thought was long gone, but it's back and that's good news for defenders. For defenders, this decision is a reassuring example that boundaries are being re-established to the doctrine of vicarious liability, and in particular, to the concept of field of activities. I'm now going to hand back to Laura, who will speak a bit more about vicarious liability and two recent decisions of note. So back to you, Laura. Thanks, Gemma. So following on from Gemma's summary of the Shelbourne case, I want to mention the recent Supreme Court cases of Morrison's and Barclays Bank. These decisions are pretty significant in respect of the law on vicarious liability, and we will be talking about them in more depth in a forthcoming podcast, but we wanted to cover them here um, briefly as well. For employers, insurers and defence lawyers like us, there were increasing concerns about the judicial approach over the last few years, which was, was expanding both the circumstances in which an employer could be liable for their employee's negligence and also the workers for whom an employer might find themselves liable, including, for example, independent contractors. The decisions in Morrison's and Barclays Bank have put a halt on that exp expansion and have arguably put the law on vicarious liability back to where it was. Defences based on the wrongdoer being on a frolic of their own, as Gemma has mentioned, or that the wrongdoer was an independent contractor are back on the table. In the Morrison's case, a disgruntled employee, Andrew Skelton, posted personal data about his colleagues on the internet. As a result, he was jailed for eight years. A number of the employees that were sued Morrison's on the basis that they were vicariously liable for his actions. The Court of Appeal in England held that Mr Skelton's actions formed an unbroken chain of events with his employment duties and so Morrison's were indeed liable for his wrongdoing. However, in the Supreme Court, the President, Lord Reid, said that the wrongful act must be within the scope of the employee's duties. So the fact that Mr Skelton's employment gave him the opportunity to do what he did, that was not enough to trigger vicarious liability on the part of his employer, Morrison's. And in the Barclays Bank case, a doctor had been accused of sexually assaulting Barclays employees during medical examinations. Dr Bates was, to all intents and purposes, an independent contractor. Again, the Supreme Court overturned the Court of Appeal decision, which had found Barclays liable for Dr Bates' actions. The Supreme Court stated that when it is clear the wrongdoer is carrying out their own business, the principle of vicarious liability does not apply. So some welcome clarity on this difficult area of law and some good news for employers and insurers alike. And on to some more positive results for defenders. The next two cases um, and the last two cases that we want to cover relate to false statements but in different contexts. The first is the English case of Jet to Holidays against Hughes and Hughes. In 2016, Mr and Mrs Hughes had gone on a package holiday with Jet to remember those. Um, after their return, they intimated claims for food poisoning, providing witness statements under the English pre-action protocol for personal injury claims. However, Jet2 obtained social media posts which undermined the allegations. Now, no court action was ever raised by the Hughes. Nonetheless, Jet2 wanted to bring contempt of court proceedings, criminal proceedings, against them. The question was whether this was competent when there had been no litigation. 
The Court of Appeal held unanimously that the High Court in England and Wales had jurisdiction to commit accused for contempt of court even without court proceedings having been raised. The statements, if false, and it appeared that they were, interfered with the administration of justice. Now, whilst this is an English decision, it's hoped claimant solicitors in Scotland will be more cautious around the validity of pre-litigation claims, but this may also whet the appetite for similar litigation in Scotland. Albeit to date here, there has definitely been more judicial reticence around the concept of holding claimants to account for fraudulent or dishonest behaviour. Once clocks are in place, the potential for an increase in fraudulent claims may well drive defenders, though, to push the issue further. And the last case I wanted to discuss is AB against Inverurie Skip Hire Limited. This was actually a case where Brodie's, um, principally my colleague Kate Donaghy, acted for the defender and its insurer. The pursuer, an HGV driver, sustained a head injury after he fell from a trailer and he pursued a claim against his employer in Broody Skip Hire. He litigated in February 2017 in the court of session and liability was admitted. The pursuer valued his claim at about £2.5 million, while our own valuation was around the £270,000 mark. So taking account of contributory negligence, a tender was lodged in June 2018 at £225,000. At the end of March, early April 2019, we lodged surveillance evidence and further medical reports commenting on the surveillance footage. They demonstrated clearly that the extent of the pursuer's injury and fitness for work were quite different from the position represented by the pursuer in his pleadings and his own experts. Following release of that evidence, which was on the eve of the pre-trial meeting and, and just several weeks before proof, the pursuer accepted the tender. So all fine so far, but the pursuer then opposed our motion for expenses to be awarded to the defender from the date of the tender onwards. As many of you will be aware, a tender is a formal offer to settle, and one of the consequences is that if the pursuer delays in accepting it, then they may be faced with an award of expenses against them from the date of the tender to the date of acceptance. The pursuer's position was that the late lodging of the surveillance footage led to unnecessary procedure. That is, had the footage been, footage been lodged earlier, the case would have settled. They founded on the court guidance which promotes early disclosure and says that there um, may be an award of expenses against a party if they fail to disclose evidence at an early stage or as soon as it's available. However, the guidance also says that no such award will be made if the party has a reasonable excuse for delaying disclosure. And in this case, Lord Bannatyne found that such a reasonable excuse arose. And he said, for surveillance to be effective, it has to be carried out in circumstances where it is not disclosed to the pursuer. Disclosure would fundamentally undermine its effectiveness and that to be credible and convincing, the surveillance must be carried out on a number of occasions over a reasonably substantial period of time and up to a point as close as possible to the diet of proof. Otherwise, a defender risks being met with the he has good days and bad days response, which I'm sure many of you have heard before. Lord Bannatyne had little sympathy for the inference that the claimant's solicitor was not aware that the claimant had been lying. He also said something else that I thought was interesting about surveillance, and that was that there's no obligation to disclose it before the proof. His comments aren't binding on this point, but they're helpful as it's something which defenders, um, defenders listeners have grappled with over recent years. That's the tension between the requirement for early disclosure of evidence and the ability to take a pursuer by surprise and challenge their credibility at proof when they're given evidence. If Lord Bannatyne's views are held across the board, then it does mean defenders are still able to keep surveillance or other evidence which can be used to attack a pursuer's credibility in their back pocket if they wish to do that. So ending there on a positive note, I think, for defenders. Now, before moving on to questions, you might be wondering why we haven't addressed the elephant in the room. Um, that is COVID-19 claims, and that's because our colleagues will be talking about that particular elephant in a separate webinar, so please do sign up 
for that. So that's all that Gemma and I have to say, but we are more than happy to answer any questions. So there's um, one question uh, here in relation to quox and pre-action protocol for disease um, are both likely to be in place later this year. Um, that is our understanding um, that they will be in place later this year. And I suspect that yes, um, in response to that question, there will be stockpiling of claims, of course, um, subject to um, time limits that apply and that we can expect that there will be a flurry of um, claims, including things like deafness claims, after quarks um, come, into, come into play. Um, Another question here, um, do you think that the Barclays Bank decision on independent contractors impacts on the law around non-delegable duties of care? Um, it's, a good, it's a good question, but in short, no, I don't think it does. Vicarious liability and non-delegable duties are similar but quite distinct principles. The, the criteria that was set down in um, Woodlands against Essex City Council about when an organisation would have a non-delegable duty remain, remain true. So if those criteria are met, then for example, a local authority or a healthcare provider, um, they could still find themselves on the hook for the negligent actions of, a, of an independent contractor. I see Laura, there's one here which I'll take. It is, can stepchildren seek a loss of society award? So the answer to that question is yes, but only if the pursuer can show that they were accepted by the deceased as a child of the deceased family. So things like place of residence will be looked at for that. Things like did the pursuer have their own room at the deceased, the deceased residence and also were they treated the same as other blood children? Thanks, Gemma. Um, just another one. Um, for you there um, on the Inveruri case, um, does that mean that surveillance evidence doesn't have to be lodged as a production? What's your I think, um, well, I think as you said, Laura, um, Lord Bannantyne's comments aren't binding, um, but if we assume they are held across the board by other judges, the answer to that question is yes, based on what that decision tells us. Um, surveillance evidence will not have to be lodged as a production at all before the proof starts. Um, it will be lodged at the point of attack um, during cross-examination of the pursuer um, to test his or her credibility when their evidence starts to deviate from what, from what the surveillance evidence will show. Thanks for that. Um, and possibly a final question if, if no one else has any questions in relation to success fees. Um, there's a question um, someone's asked if the cap was actually up to 50% of damages. Um, that's, that's right, but that applies to claims that are not personal injury or employment tribunal. I think that's the only other ex exception. So for personal injury um, claims, the caps are, as I set out, um, and as on the, the table earlier on in the, the slides. Okay, well, if we have no further questions, then we will um, end our meeting. Please, if you, anything does come up um, that you want to contact us about, then our contact details are there. Um, otherwise, um, we will sign off. Have a lovely sunny afternoon. Um, hope you get a chance to get outside and enjoy it. Thanks. Thank Bye. you so much. Bye.